Adventures of Hurry Man. Jody Exposition was an American archaeologist who went searching for Atlantis, which he claimed was on top of Mount Ararat. When scholars told him he had his stories mixed up, he secured funding from the University of Southern North Dakota at Hoople and mounted his first, okay, his only, expedition to find it. When he found a single tree above the timber line and declared it Atlantean, his guides had had enough and went home, leaving him on the mountain. He was never seen or heard from again. You know, that Professor Jody sure sends back a lot of stuff. Wait, his last name is Jody. Then maybe this isn't the guy I was thinking of. These three dig through the boxes until they come up with a couple of necklaces. Why don't that Professor Jody just send back the one necklace, the one all them legends are all about? Clicker, take this and put it around your neck. Lazy, give him the poison. The necklace thereafter is supposed to protect the wearer from all harm, basically make the person immortal. Our boss's test to see if it works is, put the necklace on, drink poison, see if you survive. He goes through more henchmen that way. Maybe that's why he's down to a couple of guys named Clicker and Lazy. Now, Lazy, Lazy, break out that antidote, will you? Huh? What do you mean? The, the stuff to counteract the poison I just drank, stupid. In case I start maybe dying or... Hey, you, you didn't forget to bring it, did you? Now, don't worry, I've got it. How do you feel? He'll need that antidote, too, because Clicker is going to collapse in agony. Why do you call him Clicker? Because he does that all the time. His real name was John Harmon, and we've seen him before on this show. His looks made him a good candidate to play a low-level henchman, and he made a career out of it, basically. This would be his third and final appearance on the Superman show. Once he's sufficiently recovered, Lazy gets to test the other necklace they found. Question. If the boss is the one who wants this necklace so bad, why doesn't he test it? They're about to be interrupted. I don't see any lights on. Of course not, silly. The museum's closed. Well, then why did you bring me along for an interview when there's nobody to talk to? I want to get a story from the Night Watchman. What on? They only think those cases were broken into. Nothing's been taken from that museum. Does the Night Watchman know you're coming so he doesn't mistakenly shoot you as intruders? In the 50s, they were allowed to do that and usually didn't get in any trouble for it. Why do you bother with this crazy stuff about a magic necklace somebody found in Tibet? Who said it's crazy stuff? It makes good copy, doesn't it? Mr. Kent says it's just a legend and that it's silly to take up space in a newspaper with it. Mr. Kent. Well, Mr. Kent doesn't know what he's talking about. Besides, I've only quoted Professor Jody's letters. Come on, let's go. The professor found it in Tibet and it's called the Taiwan Necklace. They originally called it the Taiwan On Necklace, but the producers decided that was the writers inserting a little too much of themselves into the story. Look, the door's ajar. Oh, that's funny. Well, wait a second, you oughtn't to go walking right in there. Oh, don't be silly. The night watchman probably forgot to fasten it securely. Because that's a thing night watchmen do when they're guarding a museum full of priceless treasures. Guess what? They're not going to find the night watchman. He's taking a nap somewhere courtesy of a lump on his head. We know what they'll find instead. How about me? I was out. Brother. Oh, okay, boy. okay. You've had the antidote and you're all right, aren't you? Stop worrying. It was a very unpleasant experience, boss. It's an unpleasant experience for me, too. Because we didn't find the necklace I want. Yes, nearly dying from a fast-acting poison and not finding a thing you want to steal are equally unpleasant. We all know that. What are you two doing here? We might ask you the same thing. We're on the staff. We've been working late. Oh, no, you're not. You're Jake Morrell. <laughs> I mean, excuse me. Good night. Uh, no, you don't. Lois informs them that they've been wasting their time because Professor Jody hasn't even sent the necklace yet. Morrell says, then I'll go get it no matter what it takes. That thing is going to be mine. He actually believes the legend. He forgets there are likely two things that the necklace won't protect him from, even if it's real. Handcuffs and jail bars. If he gets caught, the necklace will let him be immortal while he poops in a bucket. Right now, he's going to go ahead and kidnap these two. Next morning, Perry is throwing a fit because they're not at work. It never occurs to him that something might have happened to them. They all do these things just to annoy him. Based on the characters so far, I'm starting to think this episode should have been titled Craniorectal Inversion. 
Kent speaking. If that's one of them on the phone to some feeble excuse, you can... just a minute, Chief. What's that? Her wallet. Her wallet? Yeah. Uh, I understand. I'll be right down. That was the airport. They found her wallet on the runways this morning. Good move, Lois. Clark talks to the folks at the airport, and only one plane took off from that particular area, a private one at that. The man can give Clark the plane's tail number so Inspector Henderson can find the owner, because apparently the airport where this plane stuff actually happens isn't privy to that information. Uh-huh. Needless to say, it's registered to one Jake Morrell, millionaire and criminal. He landed in Africa, refueled, and is headed for Pakistan. It's not hard to suss out where his ultimate destination is. Kent, I want you to get on the first commercial flight and go over there. Sounds more like a job for Superman. There's no time to waste trying to find Superman. You get on that plane. I'll try to locate Superman if you really need him. Uh, sure, Chief. Three, two, one. Now, just where would I look for Superman if I really did want him? There's a principle floating around out there that a lot of people think is a good idea, and Perry seems to have forgotten about it. Give me a second, I'll remember what it was. Oh, come on. In Tibet, Professor Jody's man has spotted the plane. Thank professor, you. Professor! Shut up about that now. But sorry, but not Can't God! in the middle of a press conference? This gentleman is from a news service in India. I was just about to show him the necklace. You know how much publicity means to me. All my life, I've been a poor, unnoticed archaeologist. I'm glad to receive the attention my little find has caused. As this season progresses, we're going to stop being serious and start playing most everything for laughs. For me, starting with that statement. This guy got into archaeology to get money and publicity. Archaeology. I think he watched Boris Karloff in The Mummy too many times. He says he found the necklace in the tomb of the ancient Emperor Taiwan. A bunch of tablets around it told the story of its magic. Sahib, put it away. People are coming. Of course they're coming. People all over the world know of my find. A plane has landed. A plane with private markings. What's that? You must hide it. There may be danger. Danger? How could they be? I'm wearing it. It hasn't occurred to him that someone might want it worse than he does and isn't too particular about how they acquire it. Then again, this guy went into archaeology to get rich and famous, so we know he's a bit of an educated nitwit. The people from the plane aren't here yet, but they can hear Superman approaching. The characters haven't said the word Tibet enough times for us to catch it. That's why they put it on the screen to make sure we know it's Tibet. And they have to use that particular font to let us know it's the Far East. It's nice how our show goes out of its way to make sure we can keep up. Except I can't keep up with why Superman did that. Why doesn't he introduce himself and tell them what those other guys are doing? <laughs> laughing. Why are you laughing? At your words, Professor. I do not mean to belittle your findings, but to say that a legend could protect you. Who are you? Where do you come from? I guess that's why he had to change clothes first. The professor is beyond elated to see an American reporter here, too. Now he'll really get a swelled head, I mean, get the publicity he deserves. You're just in time to see a demonstration of my necklace. Well, if you're Professor Jody, perhaps you can help me. You see, I'm trying to find another American. He has a girl and a youngster with him, and I'm... Wait a minute. Don't interrupt. This gentleman was laughing. He cuts Clark off in the middle of a sentence to say, don't interrupt. I cannot top that. He can't handle skepticism from both the Indian reporter and Clark. He'll show them. Half off. Take my revolver. Fully loaded. Live shells. Take it, I say. Fire. Oh, so he. Just oh, no, professor. professor, I apologize. Oh, if I've you offended you, have I... have the powers demonstrated on oh, you. Oh, no, please, no. I have apologize. Professor, I think this has gone far enough. Hey. Now, please. He's not just lost in his own ego. He's crazy. He finally decides he'll test it on the American, and that way the whole world will know it's real. Before anybody can react, he's put the necklace on Clark. Excuse us, we're looking for Professor Jody. My name's Morell. Clark! Lois, Jimmy, are you all right? 
Mr. Karen. Suddenly, a lot of people believe in the necklace because that bullet put a nice hole in Clark's coat, but it didn't put a hole in Clark. Did the necklace really save him? Be quiet. Of course not. He must be the most fortunate man on earth. Maybe the bullet glanced off his belt or hit a coin in his pocket. Who cares? But it plays right into my hands, doesn't it? So he's not crazy, he's a fraud. And Abdul there is in on it. Except I doubt that was supposed to happen with real bullets. He told Abdul to use his knife. The gun was an accident. A rather happy accident for the professor, and a rather uncomfortable one for Mr. Kent. And the professor still hasn't figured out what Morell is doing there. He thinks we're all one big happy family celebrating his good fortune. He takes them all to Taiwan's tomb to show them where he found the necklace. The necklace was lying in the hands of the image, the true guardian of Taiwan's tomb. It was intact. It can never be destroyed. Don't be alarmed. Nothing can harm me while I wear this. That's a comforting thought when one of us is getting sliced in half, thanks a bunch. He's written down his translation of the instructions for how to use the necklace, and somehow when nobody was looking, he made a deal with Morell to sell him the necklace for a million dollars. I've talked about it before, but throughout the first half of the 20th century and well into the 60s and 70s, a million dollars was the Mount Everest of money. In a time when the average annual salary was about $15,000, you can imagine what a million looked like to most people. A billion? You must have mispronounced it. There is no such word. That's why people got so dramatic about it. One million dollars. Clicker has it with him in the briefcase. A million dollars? Gosh. For his next line, Jimmy invented the expression, been there, done that. He considered telling the professor what a great fire you can make with that stuff, but he had a hunch it wouldn't go over too good. Morell wants to be absolutely sure that what happened to Clark wasn't just dumb luck. He wants a thorough demonstration. He'll get it. You see, Morell, the magic necklace did save Mr. Kent. Yeah. Yeah, it, it works, boss. Of course it does. Mr. Kent? Here I am, Jimmy. Mr. Kent, did you see that? Mm-hmm. That professor isn't crazy at all. Why, the legend is true. Next, he'll empty his gun at the professor with no effect. And Clark? He's just standing back, smiling at the whole thing. I have a feeling he can see the gimmicks. Now that's up! Here, the money's yours. I'll buy the next. Agreed. Mr. Kent, you must be crazy. What are you doing? You didn't think you were going to keep the million, did you? They tried to tell you, Professor. Morell has his boys take everyone outside except the Professor and Abdul. They're both down for the count. As you saw, most of the cave-in fell on the Professor and Abdul. Clark decided the best way to atone for accidentally killing them was just to stay there and tomb with them for the rest of his life. Neither he nor Superman was ever seen again. After he released Lois and Jimmy, Jake Morrell's plane crashed and he was reduced to a puddle of goo except for two fingers that were still clutching the necklace. A member of the cleanup crew put it in his pocket and took it home to his wife. Needless to say, he had a memorable night. Clark is tending to the professor and Abdul. He can get them out of there, but not before he makes the professor come clean. Your servant's all right, professor. How are you? A million dollars. My greatest chance in a lifetime. I wanted the money for my work, for my expeditions. Well, sir, that's what happens sometimes when you try to commit a fraud. Clark says the phony build-up with the letters to the newspapers and all the rest, all the hype, just so you could rope in some rich sucker like Morrell. You convinced him with a breakaway knife and blanks in the gun, but forgot to consider the kind of person you're dealing with. Oh, no. I did wrong. It was all a fraud. But why should you be punished with me? Clark says, I think I hear something. He conveniently bumps the torch and extinguishes it so it's pitch dark. 
He says, I'm going to go look around and see if I can find another way out. Hurry up, boss. That stuff will go off pretty quick. You boys better run. I've got the next. Yeah. Hey, boss! Somebody's coming! Jimmy is all excited because since he has the necklace, he and Lois can both hold on to it and the dynamite won't hurt them. Lois is somewhat less than convinced. You crazy kid, that's no good. Superman! Superman! Superman arrives just in time and disposes of the dynamite, as if we expected anything else. Golly, Superman, we didn't need your help. You ought to be helping Mr. Kent and the professor. Now don't worry about them, Jim. They're taken care of. Oh, incidentally, I hope the professor has learned his lesson. Lesson? Yes, for inventing this little fraud. Jimmy says, it's not a fraud, this thing works. He puts it on and says, while I'm wearing this, nothing can hurt me. Ow! It kicked me on the shin. Oh, it hurts. What did you say? It hurts! Huh? I mean, that dynamite, we could have been... <sighs> At least she only kicked your shin, Jimmy. Could have been a lot worse. Thanks for watching, kids. And remember, clicking that like button is cool. Subscribing is even cooler. Leaving a comment is as cool as the coolest person you know. And becoming a patron makes you almost just like Superman. So don't hesitate. Do it today. Until next time. These three dig through the boxes until they come up with a couple of necklaces. Uh, oh, good grief, all right.